Before the video starts, all of the spoilers for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet lie ahead. Like, like all of the spoilers. You've been warned. I don't think many people will argue with me when I say that Scarlet and Violet had one of the most impactful endings in all of Pokemon. I mean, you got it all, from Storm in Area Zero to finding out Arwen's mom and dad were actually a robot the whole time, fighting said robot, running around on top of an eldritch horror that very well may destroy the world, helping your legendary bike find where Wait, what was that last one again? At a quick glance, the ending of these games seems pretty straightforward, with all of the lingering questions from the game wrapped up by a weirdly attractive robot. But if you keep playing after the credits and dig a little deeper, you'll find that in reality, none of the questions were answered at all, everything you thought you knew was a lie, and we're probably all going to die in the DLC. But fear not, for where there are questions, there are answers. And today, I'm leaving the math behind and doing a deep lore dive instead. Today, I'm going to explain everything we know about the mysterious Scarlet and Violet book and hopefully use what we learn to predict what exactly is going to happen in the inevitable Scarlet and Violet DLC. And let me just tell you, it's way crazier than you think. So, if you want to see more stuff like this, then dropkick that subscribe button. <laughs> oh, I said dropkick the subscribe button, not me, you idiot. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Richard? Hit that intro! Our story today begins and ends with the Scarlet or Violet book, depending on which game you're playing. For simplicity's sake, I'm just gonna call it the Scarlet. Oh crap, they both end in L-E-T! Uh, whatever, I'll just call it the book. Pfft, lame. Even if you haven't looked into the lore of these games at all, you've definitely seen this book before. It's the one that Arvin is using throughout the whole game to locate the Titan Pokemon and the Herba Mystica so that he can make the world's best sandwiches to heal his sick puppers. Best storyline in the whole game by a long shot, by the way. Nimona and Team Star, pff, take a hike. Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this fabled tome it's nothing more than a really old cookbook or something, but after beating the game, Arvin decides to finally return the book to the library, allowing us to read it. Turns out, the section on Herba Mystica is only a tiny portion of a book all about Area Zero, that big hole in the middle of the region. The book is a first-hand account written by a dude named Heath about the first successful exploration into Area Zero around 200 years ago. The book seems to have been written in real time during their expedition, with everything in the order that the expedition team discovered them in. But to better understand everything we're working with here and how it all connects, I'm going to go a bit out of order and start with the end. On the very last page of the book, after even the acknowledgments and the about the author section, is this picture and a message that has some letters blocked out. Now, this had my escape room sense tingling, like maybe the missing letters could be pieced together to form a secret message or something. But sadly, this doesn't seem to be the case. As far as I could tell, it's just supposed to insinuate that it's difficult to read, like maybe it was written in a rush or something. Luckily, there's more than enough here that I was able to easily figure out what it says. He talks about how, while he was briefly separated from the group, he encountered a mysterious disc-shaped Pokemon with a hexagonal shell that shone brighter than gemstones. We know that this is Heath who's writing this, because earlier in the book there's a page where he mentions that he was briefly separated from the group and was found unconscious sometime later with a paper in his hand that was written in his handwriting, but he doesn't remember writing it. The paper he's referencing has diagrams with lots of hexagons, just like the shell of the creature that he encountered. So we know that at some point in the depths of Area Zero, Heath was separated from the group, encountered this strange disc Pokemon, scrawled this note in the back of the book, fell unconscious, and awoke some time later without any memory of the incident. So that begs the question, who the hell is this disc Pokemon? Well, there's not enough information here for us to be sure, but from the book alone, we can actually learn a great deal about its capabilities. 
First of all, many have drawn parallels between the hexagonal gem-like appearance of Disco Ball and the effects that happen when you terastalize a Pokemon. This game's gimmicky attempt to spice up battles, where instead of turning into a temporary mega version of themselves or unleashing a super powerful attack, man, they just get to wear a hat for a few turns. Or in the case of Quaxly, two hats. No, no, I don't care that it's supposed to be a pompadour. It is a backwards baseball cap. You cannot change my mind. I will die on this hit. And there's actually a lot more evidence to support this connection. Normally, you can only terastalize a Pokemon using an item called a Terra Orb. But in the book, we learn that Pokemon can actually spontaneously terastalize on their own deep within the crater. And that it was the game's professor who invented the Terra Orbs using the crystals within Area Zero, which happened to be hexagonal in shape and shine brighter than gemstones. I mean, seriously, these things are, oh, these things are bright. So we have our first connection. It's pretty clear that Disco Ball is somehow related to or responsible for these crystals in Area Zero. Maybe it created the crystals, maybe they're a part of its shell that broke off, maybe it used them to build its shell, it's not clear. My personal favorite theory is that Disco Ball plummeted to the Earth from space and made this impact crater when it landed, and that it's actually lying just beneath the surface, and these gems are parts of its shell that's peeking up from beneath the dirt, but there's really only one piece of evidence to support this, and that's that it would be freaking awesome and Game Freak would be fools if they don't use it. Fools, I say. Also, I'm now realizing that the name Disco Ball really only makes sense on paper. It, it's disc, you know, like like the disc Pokemon, disc o ball, and it, and it shines like a, like a disco, yeah, you get it. So if Disco Ball is related to these crystals, and these crystals are responsible for terastalization, then it follows that Disco Ball must be connected to terastalization somehow. All right, question answered. Let's wrap it up. Oh, oh, there are 11 more sections we have to go through. All right. Another big mystery of Area Zero is the Paradox Pokemon, alternate forms of Pokemon we already know from either an age long gone or the distant future, depending on which game you're playing. While visiting the different labs within Area Zero, the AI professor explains to you that the big project Turo or Sada was working on was a time machine. Using the same crystals that made terastalization possible, they were able to somehow open a one-way door to the past or the future, which allowed these Paradox Pokemon to flood into Area Zero. However, comparing that to the story in the book, this can't actually be true, or at least not the full story. The time machine was built 10 years ago, and yet in Heath's book, which remember was written 200 years ago, he tells of an encounter they had with a Paradox Dawn fan. This means that the professor's time machine could not have been the impetus for Paradox Pokemon to come through. They were already here long before the professor even got there. How is this possible? Well, we know that the time machine was powered by Disco Ball's crystals, so perhaps there was already some sort of time rift present in the crater that Paradox Pokemon could come through, and the professor was just working on, I don't know, widening it, stabilizing it. It's hard to tell. But the point stands, in addition to being able to temporarily augment a Pokemon's type via terastalization, we know that Disco Ball's crystals also have some influence over time itself. What's the connection between these two things? Well, I have no idea. So from this book, it's clear that Paradox Pokemon have been inhabiting Area Zero for quite some time now, and it's likely their presence that has made Area Zero so dangerous to explore. We know that Paradox Pokemon are very powerful and highly aggressive, but have you ever stopped to wonder why? Why is this ancient Jigglypuff with a head tail as strong as most lower tier legendary Pokemon. And if it really is an ancient form of Jigglypuff, what happened to it over the years? To figure this out, let's start by looking at the Paradox Pokemon from Violet. All of these Pokemon are from the distant future and reading the Pokedex entries for them, it turns out that they aren't actually Pokemon at all. They are fully mechanical beings built by some future civilization for uh, reasons, likely with a similar technology to the AI professor. But why would a future civilization want to build robot versions of Pokemon? I can think of two reasons. 
Perhaps in the future, these Pokemon have simply gone extinct or are on the brink of it, and they made these robots in an attempt to preserve them in some way. Another explanation that I think fits a bit better with, you know, humanity's poor track record, is that they were constructed as weapons. Their usual counterparts weren't strong enough, and so they built supercharged robotic versions of Pokemon that could be stronger. And considering one of the Pokemon they chose to robotize is Delibird, you know what, yeah, fair enough. This second explanation I think is further supported when we take Scarlet's prehistoric Paradox Pokemon into account. I suppose it's possible that these Pokemon are also synthetic versions of regular Pokemon made by some highly advanced ancient civilization, but frankly, I couldn't find any evidence to support that. So it seems more likely to me that these are indeed ancient versions of modern day Pokemon that were far more powerful. To understand why they're so much stronger, I first need to take a page out of a fellow Charles's book and talk about some good old Darwinian evolution. Come on, I'm the math and science guy. I couldn't just talk about lore the whole time. Now, evolution is a well-established mechanic in the Pokemon universe, always has been, but a little beaver turning into a larger beaver isn't actually how evolution works in our world at all. A single Pokemon turning into another is more akin to what we would typically call metamorphosis, or sometimes just growing up. This is just a bigger paw me. You cannot convince me otherwise. Darwinian evolution works very differently and a lot slower. At its core, it's basically just statistics, predicated on the idea that a creature with genes and traits that help it survive in its specific environment is more likely to live long enough to pass those traits down onto its children. Over hundreds of generations, the helpful traits are passed down while the harmful ones are weeded out, leading to creatures that are perfectly suited to their specific environments. Things like giraffes with long necks to reach the high leaves of trees, butterflies with impressively colored wings to ward off predators or camouflage with their surrounding, and humans with bigger brains to better utilize tools and develop complex communication methods so that they can make overly complicated videos about a children's game. We know for a fact that this form of evolution exists within the world of Pokemon as well, thanks to the existence of regional variants, like a Vulpix that is adapted to live in either a hot or cold climate. But what does any of this have to do with Paradox Pokemon? Well, we can extrapolate that being more powerful in the ancient past provided an evolutionary advantage that it does not offer anymore, implying the existence of some sort of threat or predator back then that no longer exists. See where I'm going with this? Whether through natural evolution or human engineering, it's clear that these Paradox Pokemon were made to fight something very powerful and something that is not a threat in the present time. But who? Disco Ball seems like the most obvious candidate to me, seeing as it's kind of the main focal point of the book, but there's really not enough evidence to say for sure one way or the other. So after all that, it seems like we're starting to get enough pieces in place to start seeing the bigger picture that this book is painting. And it all revolves around Disco Ball. It's crystals that contain within them the power of terrestrialization and control over time itself, the paradox Pokemon that it has allowed to come to the present day, and the mysterious threat that they are clearly equipped to deal with, whether it's Disco Ball itself or something else. A threat that does not exist in our current time, but might very well be on its way in the DLC. But hey, that's not the full story actually. There are still a lot of pieces that don't fit anywhere and a lot of pages from this book that I haven't brought up yet because I have no idea what to make of them. I'll talk about them briefly here. Maybe we can keep this discussion rolling in the comments to see if we can make them fit somewhere. I don't know. Early on in the book, Heath mentions that they discovered a mysterious symbol in the ground by one of their campsites. There's a drawing in the book and when we explore area zero, we can actually find the place that he's talking about. The symbol is four circles and a square with elongated sides. I have no idea what this means. It doesn't match up with the hexagonal motif of all the disco ball stuff, and the symbol doesn't show up anywhere else in the book or the game as far as I can tell. 
I've seen some people try and connect this symbol to the four ruinous Pokemon in the game, which are basically said to be cursed items given life by negative human emotions imbued within them. But aside from the fact that there are four of them and they're locked behind circular seals with admittedly very different patterns on them, I couldn't really find anything that connects them specifically to this symbol. I also considered if maybe these four are the threat that the Paradox Pokemon are facing, but I don't know. The Pokedex talks a pretty big game about them, but I don't know, looking at their actual stats, they're pretty strong, but not enough to warrant the creation of a whole robot army. I also considered if they could actually be Paradox Pokemon themselves, which would connect them back to the crater in some way. After all, they do have the same base stat total as most of the Paradoxes at 570, and the folklore surrounding them sounds similar to the way people talk about Paradox Pokemon in the game, almost like fairy tales or cryptids. But they also don't have the signature ability that all the Paradox Pokemon have of Protosynthesis or Quark Drive, and they don't really look like any of the older Pokemon that we already know, so it seems like there's something different entirely. Also, as one last note, all of their names are based on Chinese, while most of the other Pokemon native to the region have names based on Spanish. Just an interesting little tidbit, maybe suggesting they're not originally from Paldea. I don't know. Another crater landmark mentioned in the book is this tablet here. It seems to show a symbol that looks like an hourglass with two dots next to it, and it has a little map of Paldea in the corner. The book says that the tablet is made from an incredibly hard substance, and they couldn't dent it at all, which makes them wonder how someone managed to engrave it. Like the round symbol, I couldn't find anything related to this in the game at all. I've seen some people on Reddit say that the lines match up with all the towns on the map, but I looked myself, and unless I'm missing something, it's not even close. There's also the section on Herba Mystica, which, despite the fact that it's the main thing the book is used for throughout 90% of the game, is incredibly brief. Basically, the explorers found these plants grown in Area Zero and realized that they bestow vigor on those who eat it. They tried planting them elsewhere in the region, but some wild Pokemon got to them and turned into the Titan Pokemon that we see throughout the game. Or, I mean, probably not the same exact Titans that we see in the game, since that would make them 200 years old. And I mean, come on. Palia is not that big, and these titans are not subtle. I think people would notice a massive bird dropping rocks on this mountain after a century or two. That's literally the only mention of Herba Mystica or the titan Pokemon in the whole book, aside from maybe this diagram and the note that Heath doesn't remember writing, which shows a hexagon getting larger, like the Pokemon got larger, but that is a super vague connection. But it seems like... For some reason, we can add growing plants that sometimes make you big to the list of Disco Ball's powers. And lastly, there's this one section about halfway through the book that seems super out of place. I'm sure you've seen it by now in thumbnails and stuff, but it shows a sketch of a Pokemon that appears to be a fusion of the three legendary Swords of Justice of Unova or the three legendary Beasts of Johto, depending on which game you're playing. And the note says that one of the explorers was inspired by the cruelty of the strange Pokemon within Area Zero, but it's really just something that some dude made up and sketched while he was bored. I honestly have no idea what to make of this or why it was included. Like, from an in-game lore standpoint, why would Heath choose to include a random sketch of his friend's fakemon, essentially, in his published book about Area Zero? And from a game development standpoint, they probably wouldn't introduce something like this unless they were planning on revealing it in the DLC or later. But if it's just something that this guy made up, then it'd be even weirder if it actually turns out to be real. Maybe the artist's mind was influenced by Disco Ball in some way to make him see this thing in his head. I mean, we know that Heath lost his memory of meeting it while he was separated, so it's not outside the realm of possibility, but... I really don't know, and I don't think we'll be able to know more until we find out if this thing actually exists or if it's just a really weird easter egg. And that's it, the entirety of the Scarlet and Violet book explained with as much of it tied together as I possibly could. This is pretty different from the stuff I usually do. Most of the time I'm using math and statistics to answer weird video game questions, mostly Pokemon stuff because that seems to be the only thing that YouTube will recommend to people for some reason. But if you wanna see more lore and theory videos, let me know. Puzzling it all together and peeling back the mystery was super fun. But 
I'm afraid that's all I have for today's video. So until next time, don't forget to take it easy.